Hi there. Uh, we're going to do chapter four of Wind in the Willows, and it's called Mr. Badger. So we'll see whether Mole and Rat escape the wild wood. They waited patiently for what seemed a very long time, stamping the snow to keep their feet warm. At last they heard the sound of slow, shuffling footsteps approaching the door from inside. It seemed the Mole remarked to the Rat like one walking, like someone walking carpet slippers that were too large for him and down a heel which was intelligent of Mole, because that's exactly what it was. There was the noise of a bolt shot back, and the door opened a few inches, enough to show a long snout and a pair of sleepy blinking eyes. Now, the very next time this happens, said a gruff and suspicious voice, I shall be exceedingly angry. Who is it this time, disturbing people on such a night? Speak up! Oh, badger, cried the rat, let us in, please. It's me, Rat, and my friend Mole, and we've lost our way in the snow. "'What, Ratty? My dear little man!' exclaimed the Badger, in quite a different voice. "'Come along in, both of you at once. Why, you must be perished! "'Well, I never lost in the snow, and in the wild wood, too, and at this time of night. "'But come in with you!' "'The two animals tumbled over each other in the eagerness to get inside, "'and heard the door shut behind them with great joy and relief. "'The Badger, who wore a long dressing gown, and whose slippers were indeed very down at heel, carried a flat candlestick in his paw, and had probably been on his way to bed when their summons sounded. He looked kindly down on them and patted both their heads. This is not the sort of night for small animals to be out, he said paternally. I'm afraid you've been up to some of your pranks again, Ratty. But come along, come into the kitchen. There's a first-rate fire there and supper and everything. He shuffled on in front of them, carrying the light, and they followed him, nudging each other in an anticipating sort of way down a long, gloomy and to tell the truth decidedly sh decidedly shabby passage into a sort of central hall out of which they could dimly see other long tunnel-like passages branching passages mysterious and without apparent end but there were doors and in the hall as well stout oaken comfortable looking doors one of these badger flung open and at once they found themselves in all the glow and warmth of a large firelit kitchen the floor was well-worn red brick and on the wide hearth burnt a fire of logs, between two attractive chimney corners tucked away in the wall, well out of any suspicion of draught. A couple of high back settles faced each other across the side of the fire, and gave further sitting accommodations for the socially dis sociably disposed. In the middle of the room stood a long table of plain boards placed on trestles, with benches down each side, and at one end of it, where an armchair stood pushed back, were spread the remains of Badger's plain but ample supper. Rows of spotless plates winked from the shelves on the dresser at the far end of the room, and from the rafters overhead hung hams, bundles of dried herbs, nets of onions and baskets of eggs. It seemed a place where heroes could fitfully feast after victory, where weary harvesters could line up in scores along the table and keep their harvest home with mirth and song or where two or three friends of simple taste could sit about as they pleased, and eat and smoke and talk in comfort and contentment. The ruddy brick floor smiled up at the cheerful, at the smoky ceiling. The oaken settles, shiny with long wear, exchanged cheerful glances with each other. Plates on the dresser grinned at pots on the shelf, and the merry firelight flickered and played over everything without distinction. The kindly badger thrust them down on a settle to toast themselves at the fire, and bade them remove their wet coat and boots. Then he fetched them dressing gowns and slippers, and himself bathed the mole's shin and wa with warm water, and mended the cut with sticking plaster, till the whole thing was just as good as new, if not better. In the embracing light and warmth, warm and dry at last, with weary legs propped up in front of them, and the suggested clink of plates being arranged on the table behind, it seemed to the storm-driven animals, now in safe anchorage, that the cold and trackless wild wood, just left outside was miles and miles away, and all they had suffered in it a half-forgotten dream. When at last they were thoroughly toasted, the badger summoned them to the table, where it had been laying a, a vast repast. They felt pretty hungry before, but when they actually saw at last the supper that was spread before them, really it seemed only a question of what they should attack first, where it was, where all was so attractive and whether the other things would obligingly wait for them till they had time to give them their attention. Conversation was impossible for a long time, and when it slowly resumed, it was a regrettable sort of conversation that results from talking with your mouth full. 
The Badger did not mind that sort of thing, nor did he take any note of elbows on the table or everybody speaking at once. As he did not go into society himself, he had got an idea that these things belonged to the things that didn't really matter. We know, of course, that he was wrong and took too narrow a view, because they do matter very much, though it would take too long to explain why. He sat in his armchair at the head of the table and nodded gravely at intervals as the animals told their story, and he did not seem surprised or shocked at anything, and he never said, I told you so, or just what I always said, or remarked that they ought to have done so and so, or ought not to have done something else. The mole began to feel very friendly towards him. When supper was really finished at last, and each animal felt that his skin was now as tight as was decently safe, and that by this time he didn't care a hang for anybody or anything, they gathered round the glowing embers of the great wood fire, and thought how jolly it was to be sitting up so late, and so independent, and so full. And off they chatted for a time about things in general, the badger said heartily, Now then, tell us the news from your part of the world. From your part of the world. How is old Toad getting on? Oh, from bad to worse, said the rat gravely, while Mull, cocked up, this, cocked up in a settle, was basking in the firelight, his heels higher than his head, tried to look properly mournful. And as a smash-up, only last week, and a bad one. You see, he will ins insist on driving himself, and he's hopelessly incapable. If he'd only employ a decent, steady, well-trained animal, pay him good wages, and leave everything to him, he'd get on all right. But no, he's convinced he's heaven-born driver. He's a heaven-born driver, and nobody could teach him anything. And all the rest follows. And how and how many has he had? inquired the badger gloomily. Smashes or machines? asked the rat. Oh well, after all, it's the same thing with Toad. This is the seventh. As for the others, you know that coach house of his? Well, it's piled up, literally piled up to the roof, with fragments of motor cars, none of them bigger than your hat. That accounts for the other six, so far as they can be accounted for. He's been hospital three times put in the mole, and as for fines he's had to pay, it's simply awful to think of. Yes, and that's part of the trouble, continued Rat. Toad's rich, we all know, but he's not a millionaire, and he's hopelessly bad and he's a hopelessly bad driver, and quite regardless of law and order. Killed or ruined, it's got to be one of those two things sooner or later. Badger, we're his friends, oughtn't we oughtn't we to do something? The badger went through a bit of hard thinking. Now look here, he said at last, rather severely. Of course you know I can't do anything now. His two friends assented, quite understanding his point. No animal, according to the rules of animal etiquette, is ever expected to do anything strenuous or heroic or even moderately active during the off-season of winter. All are sleepy, some actually asleep. All are weather-bound, more or less, and are all resting from arduous days and nights, during which every muscle in them has been severely tested, and their energy kept at full stretch. Very well then, continued the badger, but when once the year has really turned, and the nights are shorter, and halfway through them one rouses and feels fidgety, wanting to be up and doing by sunrise, if not before, you know. Both animals nodded gravely, they knew. Well then, went on the badger, we, that is you and me, and our friend Mole here, We'll take Toad seriously in hand. We'll stand no nonsense whatever. We'll bring him back to reason, by force if need be. We'll make him a sensible Toad. Well, you're asleep, Rat. Not me, said the Rat, waking up with a jerk. He's been asleep two or three times since supper, said the Mole, laughing. He himself was feeling quite wakeful, even lively. Although he didn't know why. The reason was, of course, that he had been naturally an underground animal by birth and breeding. The situation of Badger's house exactly suited him and made him feel at home, while the rat, who slept every night in the bedroom with the windows which opened onto a breezy river, naturally felt the atmosphere still and oppressive. "'Well, it's time we're all in bed,' said the Badger, getting up and fetching the flat candlesticks. "'Come along, you two. I'll show you your quarters, and take your time tomorrow morning. Breakfast at any hour you please.' He conducted the two animals to a long room that seemed half bedchamber and half loft. The badger's winter stores, which indeed were visible everywhere, took up half the room. Piles of apples, turnips, potatoes, baskets of nuts, jars of honey. But the two little white beds on the remainder of the floor looked soft and inviting, and the linen on them, though coarse, was clean and smelled beautifully of lavender. 
and the mole and the water rat, shaking off their garments in some thirty seconds, tumbled in between the sheets in great joy and contentment. Hi everyone, we'll leave it there and we'll find out in the future what's happened, what's going to happen. Uh, will they actually take Toad in hand? Will he listen to them? Will it be too late? Who knows? I'll see you next time. Keep safe, keep happy and keep reading. Bye.